Hi, everyone. Welcome again to our Spring Live series, Time Flies. This is already our third and last live event for the Spring series. If you missed the, the first two, you can watch them on MIT CTL's YouTube channel. Um, by the way, there you will find many other great videos on supply chain management education. So feel free to explore the channel. Thank you for um, joining us today. I am Paulo Sosa Jr., course lead for SC3X Supply Chain Dynamics which is part of the MITx MicroMasters in Supply Chain Management program from MIT. Once more, I'm happy to be co-hosting this live event today with my colleague, Miguel Rodriguez Garcia, course lead for SC1X Supply Chain Fundamentals. Hello, Miguel. Hi, Paulo. Thank you so much for the introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you. I'm excited to bring the industry perspective for our MicroMasters learners once again. Uh, as you guys know, this is uh, our core, that connection between academia uh, and the industry. So we are really happy uh, to be hosting one of these events again. So today we are going to be discussing two key topics in supply chain management. One is going to be network design and the other one is going to be inventory management. And for that, we have an amazing speaker joining us from one of the largest e-commerce retailers in the world. So stay connected because this is going to be a really, really great talk. And as always, we're going to follow the same agenda. And uh, first, our guest speaker uh, will give us a presentation that will last around 25 minutes. And after that, we'll have some time at the end to answer some uh, questions from you guys, from the audience. So that will be uh, probably around 15 minutes. And, and so the total length of the live event will be 45 minutes. And we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A feature in Zoom. Please try to avoid the, the chat for questions because uh, it's going to be really hard for Paul and I to keep track of them. So uh, when you want to ask any questions to our guest speaker, use the Q&A feature in Zoom. And at the end, as we said, Paul and I will be uh, channeling those questions to our guest speaker. And remember, Paulo also mentioned that the event um, is part of the MITx MicroMasters program in supply chain management, a program that we developed here at the Center for Transportation and Logistics at MIT. And as well as supply chain fundamentals and supply chain dynamics, the MicroMasters program includes five courses in total. And some of them are currently open for enrollment. So don't hesitate to check them out. We'll be posting the link in the chat group in case you guys are interested. And now with this, back to you, Paulo, so you can introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, today, we are honored to have Rafael Grillo in Pronti, directly from Berlin, Germany. Rafael is an Operation Analytics Senior Manager at Wayfair. He leads Global Fulfillment Center Network Design within the Operations um, Analytics team. Before Wayfair, he worked for a Brazil-based consulting firm, Illus, enabling growth and competitive advantage through supply chain management strategies for e-com, retail, and CPG common, uh, companies. Rafael holds a bachelor's degree in Naval Engineering from University of Sao Paulo, and a master's in supply chain management from MIT. He's also a MicroMasters alum, which means he passed all courses from the MicroMasters program, like many of you are doing right now. As some of you may know, one, uh, one among many other benefits from earning the MicroMasters program credential is that you become eligible to apply to the MIT supply chain management blended master's program at MIT, just like Rafael did, and also to other universities around the world. All right, so um, welcome back to the MicroMasters program, Rafael. The floor is yours. Cool, it's awesome to be here, Paulo. Uh, thanks everyone for, for uh, being here as well and to discuss two super interesting topics. I remember uh, maybe four or five years ago uh, attending these live events and, and, and uh, seeing like, what folks were doing in the industry and looking forward to uh, to be doing that as well. And it it's it's great to be here uh, again now as a, a speaker. <laughs> so a bit different. But well, uh, let me get started with uh, the presentation that we have for today. Let me know if you can see my screen, but hopefully you can. Yes. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, so uh, the topic for today uh, is network design and inventory management for cost efficient in time and perfect deliveries. So network design and inventory management are rather broad topics, but I want to explore uh, a little bit of how we are doing it at Wayfair. 
in uh, more specifically uh, how I am doing within the operations analytics team, uh, of course, supported by many other teams uh, at, at Wafer. So quick uh, intro about myself, Paulo already uh, mentioned a bunch. Uh, I, I'm an MIT SCM alum from the class of 2021. Uh, I have a bachelor's in naval engineering and spent uh, six years in consulting prior to Wayfair uh, with heavy focus on network design and inventory management, which is probably the reason I ended up uh, doing what I'm doing today. <laughs> uh, I'm currently based in Berlin, Germany. Uh, so I've added two pictures that I took uh, uh, here. Uh, this, the, the one in the bottom right is the Wafer office. So we are uh, right in the central part of Berlin in the Luxemburgplatz, overlooking the TV tower, which is quite nice view uh, during the summer. This was about last week in the end of the day. Uh, but why don't we get started with what you guys are here for and not my uh, silly pictures? So let me briefly try to capture Wafer's business model in a slide. Uh, basically, Wafer is a platform that connects suppliers and customers. So suppliers are essentially the ones that manufacture the furniture and decor that we sell in our website. And customers, of course, are the people that want, want to go there and buy it. Now, the so the, the we are essentially a classic dual-sided platform like many other platforms like Uber uh, or uh, other microplaces like Amazon. Uh, the difference is we are specialized in a specific market, which is uh, home and decor. Uh, now, the, the fact that we are a dual-sided platform makes suppliers also customers in a way because our platform needs to be something that drives value for them and therefore they need to feel compelled to ship products to us or sell stuff in our website so in that sense they're also customers for us so here really supplier relationship management is key uh to doing what we do uh another key important topic we don't own inventory Apart from very specific cases where we are mandated to so to do so, but we 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 aim to be asset light in that sense. Originally, Wayfair was a pure dropship business, and by what what does that mean? Essentially, dropship business means we don't have any delivery infrastructure. We rely fully on third party. So we relied a lot on FedEx, UPS to do the deliveries. So deliveries were happening from suppliers directly uh, from their warehouses in North America and Europe to customers. Now, around 2014, we shift things around a bit and we started heavily investing in building a physical distribution network. So that entails not only adding fulfillment centers, but also adding cross docking stations, pull point stations, and delivery stations for last mile deliveries. We don't aim to own trucks, uh, despite people, uh, we, despite that, like there are, there are some times that we paint trucks with the Wayfair logo, but those trucks are not ours. They're, they're third party, they just have the, the Wayfair logo. So my, people from the US might have seen them. Uh, uh, delivering stuff near your neighborhood. Um, but yeah, uh, essentially that's what Wafer does uh, in a nutshell. Now we, uh, we serve uh, more than 20 million customers in North America, focusing on Canada and the US. US is our largest market. We also serve customers in Germany and in the UK and Ireland. Uh, our suppliers are mainly uh, in Southeast Asia, China, uh, a few of them in Eastern Europe and US and Canada. Uh, so it's really a global uh, supply chain that we're managing here, essentially needing to transport goods from Asia to North America and Europe and really managing inventory availability to a point where we can ensure that the customers are gonna have 
the products that they want near them to enable faster deliveries. Uh, last year, we recorded uh, revenues just above 12 billion. And just to give a sense of the size of the network, uh, that the footprint network that we have today, we're talking about more than 17, 17 million square feet of uh, warehousing space is adding up not only fulfillment centers, but also the delivery stations and cross docking stations that we, we have across uh, North America and Europe. Um, of course, the majority of them is fulfillment centers because they are the largest buildings, um, but uh, the other things are, um, are there as well, accounting for. Now, let me try to give you a summarized view of what the Wayfair supply chain looks like. Uh, essentially, we have two types of suppliers. We have international suppliers, which are those uh, located in Southeast, Southeast Asia and China. We have domestic suppliers, which are suppliers essentially like located in North America, Canada, uh, and Europe. Uh, they are market specific, so it's hard. It's not common that a North American supplier is going to serve Euro European customers. We actually don't want that happening because like product portfolio is different. So we try to keep them market specific. So that's why we are calling them domestic. Um, and really the international suppliers, the, the way to get them, the, the product from the suppliers into our Castlegate network, which is essentially the, the physical distribution network that we have built uh, through, since 2014. We have a few ways of doing that. For domestic suppliers, we can ship product directly from the supplier to the FC, so the fulfillment centers. Sometimes we decide to skip the fulfillment centers if, for example, the supplier has a warehouse nearby one of our fulfillment centers, there isn't really much of a reason to add a, a touch there. So we, we skip the fulfillment center and grow directly to a cross docking location where we then can inject into a parcel carrier like FedEx or UPS, or we can uh, ship it to one of our uh, asset-based delivery stations and then make the delivery to the customer. Uh, another option is sending product to uh, what we call a domestic break bulk facility. That's something that we started to do this year. It, we didn't do much uh, uh, before. So still the idea is that this domestic break bulk facility will be able to uh, break uh, the bulk coming from the suppliers. So essentially it's similar to a cross locking location. Uh, but uh, operating on the inbound side. Um, and then for the international suppliers, we also have a few options. Uh, our international suppliers, we, when we ship product, we are talking about shipping via container normally. Uh, so that means product is gonna be on water for about 30 to 40 days, depending on which coast we are uh, sending product to. If we're sending to uh, the West Coast in the in the US, that's about 30 days. If we are sending to the East Coast, that's about 40. Depends a lot. Um, and essentially the way we do that is we can ship product directly from the supplier to the FCs. So if the if and we would do that in for a supplier that has a lot of volume, so enough volume to fill up at least one or two containers. If the supplier doesn't have enough volume to fill up uh, one or two containers, what we're going to do is we're going to send the product from that supplier to what we call the international consolidation centers. And those consolidation centers, that volume is going to wait for volume from other suppliers to build up container. And then we're going to put that container from multiple suppliers in a, into a ship. And that ship is going to travel from Southeast Asia or China to uh, the US, Canada, or Europe, uh, depends uh, where uh, we are sending that product to. Then when it gets to the FCs, uh, we make decisions whether we, we are going to 
position, we are going to position that product near the customers, or if we're going to hold it back uh, to leverage on essentially safety stock pooling. And uh, that is why this whole presentation has a, a bit of inventory management built into discussion, because that decision to either postpone or anticipate the positioning, uh, it's essentially a, an inventory management decision, but mixed with network design. And then uh, we can do the, the same path that we do with domestic suppliers. We can ship uh, the from the FCs to the cross stocking when a sale is made. And then we can uh, move product from the cross stocking stations to the parcel carriers or to the delivery stations. And really what happens here is we have multiple nodes and we can do any combination of the, uh, the of nodes that it's cost optimal in a way. So it's very it gets very complex very fast. Um, and it, 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 it requires a lot of scenario modeling to uh, determine what's the optimal solution to, to get to, uh, depending on the supplier and depending on um, the type of product that we are talking about. So uh, here it's, this slide is just what we, we use internally at Wafer to define what uh, operations analytics the team I'm in does. So essentially what we are trying to do here is uh, we are operating at a long time horizon uh, for decision making and highly complex decision making. So it's, I mean, it's the best of both words in a way because it's complex, it's interesting, but it's also challenging uh, uh, it to, to do so. So it requires us to leverage a lot of our analytical ability and uh, modeling capacity to get to um, uh, a, a good answer that's gonna be robust and that's gonna give us um, the results that we're looking for in terms of cost optimality and, uh, and speed. So really the types of questions that we are trying to answer here, specifically talking about network design uh, and inventory management is, where to locate fulfillment centers, uh, where to locate cross docking centers, where to locate delivery stations. And then once we have defined where to locate those facilities, what types of items or products do we wanna hold in each facility? And what really, what infrastructure do we need to build for each facility uh, such that the facility can hold the type of inventory that we expect it to. Um, I I'm more focused on the fulfillment center network design piece. So question number one over here, and the what types of items we want to hold in HFC, the cross docking piece and the um, delivery centers piece is done by another sub team within operations analytics, but uh, I, I'm gonna try to capture that uh, in, 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 in this presentation as well. Uh, so if anyone in a way is seeing this, uh, I'm gonna try to do my best. <laughs> uh, but our, our approach to network design here uh, is really to have a, an end-to-end -end view where we can trade off cost and speed uh, fully. Uh, so really the, the tools that we have built uh, across uh, the years are tools that allows us to not only um, see what the, what's the cost optimal answer, but also see what if scenarios, because that's ultimately what we need to convince our stakeholders that answer A is better than answer B. Uh, and really uh, the, the ability to trade off speed and cost is something that um, I've seen prior to Wafer being done in many different ways. Sometimes uh, folks try to capture uh, what's the value of speed, which is some, somewhat difficult to do because there is an inherently um, strategic value to speed that is hard to put a number on, which is essentially like, 
what if my competitors invest a lot on speed and that becomes a reality in the future and I don't invest in speed? Like measuring that type of thing is very, very difficult to do. So the way we, tr we do at Wayfair is we try to uh, show what's the speed outcome and what's the cost outcome. And then we make inferences based on, on those two results. So it's almost like we have a, um, a multi-objective function of minimizing cost, but also trying to be better at speed. Um, let me go to the next slide over here. Um, in a sense, oops, okay, cool. Um, so the, 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 the ways we are tackling um, these uh, challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day is to use a combination of classical optimization and simulation methods to analyze the various scenarios uh, and trade-offs between cost and speed performance. So it's what I mentioned earlier where say you generate from, and folks from the uh, SC1X are gonna remember that there is a, um, a topic for specifically for uh, optimization modeling where essentially we're trying to get to the optimal answer for a network design configuration. Really that approach, it, it works well if you are comfortable enough to say that your optimal answer is much, much better than suboptimal answers. In some cases, what happens uh, and what we see in a day-to-day -day at Wayfair is that an optimal answer is not that much better than a suboptimal one, but sometimes a suboptimal answer is much easier to implement and to explain to a supplier, for example. So it's an, it's an important trade-off that we make in that we are able to show uh, what are the differences between um, an optimal answer and uh, the various scenarios that we can, uh, that suppliers can propose and that uh, uh, other stakeholders can propose. So we, we've we transitioned a little bit away from a classical optimization approach, specifically for FC network design to more of a simulation based approach where we basically brute force run all the scenario combinations and we choose what uh, scenarios we want to look at. Really, from a computational standpoint, there isn't much of a difference from running the two. Uh, a, a simulation model that that the simulation model that we use is capable of generating the answers within like 30 minutes running, and a classical optimization model would be maybe 10 minutes faster, but much harder to uh, uh, to 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 give you the 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 optimal answer, uh, to sorry to give you the suboptimal answers. So, we, we what we are what we are doing is generating multiple what if scenarios and then comparing them and, and and showcasing them to to our stakeholders and saying, hey, if we do path A, uh, it's a dollar per unit cheaper, but we're gonna have to transform our network entirely to be able to do that. So maybe we do something simpler in the beginning and then we transition to that option. So I think that's really where the academic uh, methods, really the rubber meets the road in, in, in that sense where we have to change a bit of how we would do, we would solve this type of problem in a controlled, uh, sealed environment, and where when we have multiple things changing at the same time, a, a huge organization and people asking for different um, uh, scenarios and suppliers wanting explanations for why are we proposing this instead of that? 
uh, we we need to be able to give them uh, sufficiently clear answers, and saying that giving 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 them an answer uh, like don't worry, trust this black box that is it's right. It's not something that they're going to be happy with. So uh, this is um, uh, the why behind we are we are we're really. Um, shifting uh the the way we we do this so um right after uh we define um the location for the fulfillment centers uh the um, the the real challenge is what types of items do we want to put in each fulfillment center so that becomes more of an inventory management type of type of thing and let me sh actually show you why this is an important thing for, for, for Wayfair, right? So imagine that, and that's a trend across all of the e-commerce, is that customers want fat deliveries happening faster and faster. And multiple competitors are pushing for that same thing to delivery faster and faster. And to do that, there isn't, there isn't a, an, another way to do it other than having product close to customers. So being able to position the types of products that sell in a specific region near the customers of that specific region is really what we are trying to do here. And it, it actually allows us to have some sort of control over the demand as well, because we can influence what people, people are going to see at the website by showing them uh, things that we have nearby. And that kind of helps shape what um, the consumer are gonna, is going to um, want to purchase. But in a way, what we are trying to do is have product near the customers. That's really just about it. But how, how we do that is the challenge because and you saw that also in uh, SE1X, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it is. But the more you try to be accurate at the regional level, so assume you break down demand too much and you try to forecast it, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be wrong more often. And by when you're wrong more often, that means you need more safety stock to cover for the times that you're wrong. And in those cases, what's, what happens is we, we tell the supplier, hey, Mr. Supplier, please send us additional inventory because uh, we are making more forecast mistakes. So we need more safety stock to cover for those mistakes. Of course, for, uh, for Wayfair, that's not necessarily a burden because we don't own the inventory, but the supplier does. So uh, we, are, we are cognizant of that. And we don't want the supplier, the, the the supplier to see their inventory levels increasing like crazy. Otherwise, uh, for them, it's going to be too much of a cash um, investment in terms of working capital uh, tied to inventory that they're not going to want to work with us. So we need to figure out a way of doing this positioning near the customer but also being able to control the inventory levels. And this is where uh, we find that um, a multi-echelon distribution strategy is really very effective. That's something that we, we are exploring uh, within uh, the operations analytics team. We're trying to uh, essentially postpone the positioning decision and actually hold um, buckets of inventory in regional hubs, and then the, uh, as the man, as we deplete the child FCs, the FCs near the customers, we ship product from our hubs to these FCs. So that cost, that additional touch costs money, but for the items that have really high margin, it's worth it. Uh, for the items where we are able to uh, leverage this speed benefit, it's worth it. 
what what's going to happen is for the items that uh, they have low margin or their demand variability is crazy high, we're not going to want to have them in every single location. That's going to be uh, that's still a hypothesis that we are uh, exploring, but still, uh, if you think about it, uh, it's something that uh, really does make 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 sense. So really, the trade-off here is if we spread too much, we increase inventory levels too much. If we spread too little, we don't leverage the the speed uh, that we want to uh, serve supplier uh, customers with. So there really is a, 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 a trade-off here that's being brought by the demand, the demand variability, the margin, the customer expectation really, the lead time variability and the lead time itself. So for, for international suppliers where the lead time is 30 days and for international suppliers where sometimes it, we are, using an unreliable shipping route that varies a lot the lead time we we're we we see that there the these things combine to form like what, what i'm calling here the ease of positioning or the difficulty of positioning for that matter uh so the for example the higher the demand variability and the higher the lead time variability the more difficult it is to position an item near um, a customer, the lower that is, the easier it is to position uh, uh, an item near uh, a customer. So that's what is being represented here by the X axis. Now, the Y axis is capturing here the value of positioning, which is essentially a combination between the customer expectation and the margin of an item. So items with very high margin and very high customer expectations in terms of fast deliveries, that means they have value uh, of high, very high value of positioning. For items where we have very low margin and low customer expectations regarding the fast deliveries, that means we have a uh, low value of positioning. Now, we, what can happen is an item has very high margin, but customers simply don't care whether they are delivered fast or not. That would be an item where we also see low value of positioning because if customers are ultimately not gonna purchase them because they're been delivered faster, really there is not much reason for us to deliver faster. So it's trying to segment, uh, what we're trying to do here is trying to segment customer expectations and value versus the challenges and difficulty and costs of doing that positioning. And really what, what we th think see here is that for items where we have, it's very easy to position them uh, and it's very high value to position them. Of course, we will want uh, to have those items positioned close to customers. So that's that's easy. That's like the best of both words. The challenge is for uh, the zones uh, over, and let me circle them over here. These ones where we want to be careful with what we do. Um, in these zones, we need to make very specific trade offs regarding the value and the challenges of positioning an item. And it's really where the multi echelon strategy that I just mentioned can be a, a, a propeller for facilitating the, the positioning uh, of products. So it's really what we are trying to leverage right now. And then we have this danger zone here, which we have no value of positioning and it's very hard to position those items. For those items, it, it's also easy enough to know what the answer is. The answer is simply don't position those items near the customers because customers don't care and it's very difficult to do so. So uh, this is really nice. This is question mark we are exploring and this is the danger zone or the, the zone where we don't wanna go <laughs> essentially.
so um with 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 that um i i i think i i spoke a lot about this and now i wanted to leave a, a few minutes for 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 you guys to ask questions regarding what we are doing uh and explore and and we can explore the, the this together instead of you just hearing me talk and talk well thank you so much rafael for the presentation i think it was great uh we already have a lot of questions so that's amazing i think we can start uh like shooting <laughs> you with some of them so the first one uh, and i'm gonna uh, try to also wrap up some of your ideas here because i think it was amazing how you shared and um, that the trade-offs between having an optimal solution uh, optimal solution versus how easy it is to actually deploy that kind of solution is is something that you don't find um when you're only in academia uh you know only uh, touching the theoretical part so do, and that's because not every cost is included in, uh, included in an optimization problem it's impossible yep. to include uh, how like the cost of uh, like changing some things uh, within the network whatsoever so and there is a question from Emir uh, Usar, uh, which is really interesting. And he asks you, what is the periodization, like the period of time that you guys use uh, to refresh the um, optimization model or the simulation model? Do you run it every month, every day, every quarter, and, and, and why? Maybe you run it differently uh, depending on the kind of decisions that you make, so. Yeah, so the, there's these models that we have, uh, they are really the intent of them is really to drive strategic decisions. So the timeline for the, the, these decisions are like two to five years. We are refreshing uh, the conclusions from that model every six months uh, to make sure that the decisions that we made six months ago they still hold based on evolving market trends, uh, market conditions. Sorry. Um, and based on really the inputs don't change that often. So for example, transportation costs, um, shipping costs, uh, rent costs, those types of things, the way we model them is to avoid changing them every six months because we don't wanna capture short-term volatility when we are modeling. We wanna capture long-term trends. So unless, market conditions change dramatically. And we think that those conditions are gonna withstand the next two to five years. We are gonna keep the same inputs, but really the rate of refresh for, 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 for this is every six months. Uh, what, what, what happens is that, this is kind of a good thing, is that every six, we, we tend to confirm the decision that was made six months ago every six months, but that brings us reassurance that we are in the, the right path. So it, I think it's one of those things where we do that because we need to keep up answering questions that stakeholders have. So what, what happens really every six months is that we receive a bunch of questions from stakeholders and we try to generate scenarios and, and show them why we think Scenario A is better than scenario B and explain why we are going with uh, that option and following that path. So it's really more of a communication um, communication uh, thing than more of a, our network is changing every six months, you know? So it's more of a strategic alignment than um, a change in direction. Yeah, no, makes total sense. Thank you so much for, for the answer. Paulo, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Rafael. Such a great presentation. Um, you explored many topics from all of our courses. So uh, SE1X for sure, inventory management, but also SE2X network design. And we have some learners from SE3X here, supply chain dynamics. And um, in this course, we discuss about supply chain strategy. Uh, you mentioned that you moved from like a cost efficient supply chain to a, a more uh, responsive supply chain in terms of speed. Um, and this is uh, great to see here in the discussion. And we have a question related to that. So Andrea, 
Uh, Andrea Lopez is asking, how do you measure how relevant speed is to a given population if you do? Um, is it a comparison with competitors or solely social fe features field research? So the way, there are two ways to doing that, essentially. One is the um, comparison with competitors, which is difficult to do. Uh, because you have to map the exact the exact same types of product that you are selling with the, the, the items that the competitor is selling. So that's a fair comparison. Uh, but we do that uh, to make sure that we are um, uh, on par with our competitors, if not better. Another way of doing that is via A-B testing. So what we do is we select um, a few <clears throat> products and we do experiments to see how um, sensitive the customers are to variations in delivery. So we are gonna select, for example, 100 customers. That's just a random number. We're gonna select a, a number of customers in those customers are gonna see that that specific item is gonna be delivered to them in five days. Then another set of customers is, are gonna see that that specific item is gonna be delivered for them in four days. Another set of, another set of customers is gonna see three days, so on and so forth, you get the, the logic. And really we measure how much uh, we convert uh, in sales for each of those groups of customers. So if customer, the customers that saw five days, you would imagine that they don't buy as much as the customers that saw four days. And uh, the customers that saw four days don't buy as much as the ones that saw three days. And so we measure that and we have essentially like a curve that shows you for every item, for every customer segment, what is their sensitivity to speed? So how much more in sales we expect to get from having faster deliveries? And that's how really we translate speed to a, a, an actual measure in, in terms of like value. Great, thank you so much, Rafael. Uh, Miguel, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, actually the next question I had, uh, I think you already answered it, uh, Rafael, because uh, it was about A-B testing. So it's really interesting what you what you shared because that's somehow a way you, you also shape the customer demand. Because if you know that uh, having a two hour delivery or same day or like uh, depending on the time windows or whatsoever, doesn't have an impact, at some point you don't have to offer that anymore and actually exactly. reduce costs. So really, uh, really, really interested. Um, yeah, so we don't have much time, but uh, I'm gonna probably I'm gonna steal one of your questions, Paulo, and then if if you still want, you can also uh, ask one more. Um, so Gustav, um, gosh, um, uh, this learner wants to know, like, when you are talking about um, holding inventory uh, nearby the fulfillment centers, a uh, safety stock, um, like. Who holds the inventory from that point? Because uh, you said, for example, that you don't have the inventory. So did you actually like force your suppliers to uh, have the safety stock for you? Because that's going to be a, a key uh, I don't know, negotiation in terms of like asking them to have this, the more stock for you guys without yeah. ownership. Yeah, so what, what we do is the product and that it depends on two things, right? We have a dropship business and we have a Castlegate business, right? And the two things operate uh, together. So the supplier holds inventory, the supplier owns the inventory, right? But they own the inventory that sits in their dropship warehouse. And they also own the inventory that sits in our Castlegate warehouse. What's going to happen is that the, um, the ranking algorithm in the website, it's gonna select the items that are closer to the customer. So if a supplier doesn't have the item availability near the customer, the customer is not gonna see their product. What's gonna happen is they're gonna, not gonna buy it. So 
because of that, that's an incentive for the supplier to have inventory in more locations. That location can be a Castlegate warehouse or it can be a dropship warehouse. For all we care, it doesn't make much of a difference uh, specifically for that. It makes a difference for other things because Castlegate has uh, uh, later cutoff times uh, so we can get faster deliveries in that sense. But um, in terms of like availability on the, the website, people are gonna see the spike being on dropship or Cascade. Now, the negotiation with the supplier it, for increasing the inventory levels is indeed complex because if, they, if we ask them to hold more inventory because we wanna be in more locations, they're gonna, they can say, no, we're not gonna obligate them to have inventory. If they don't see the value in having more inventory, they're not. So it's really a matter of setting the right incentives in the platform and setting the right costs for the supplier to operate where we want the supplier to operate in. So it's more of a incentive-based approach than a, you need to have inventory here, you're gonna be punished if you don't type of thing, you know? So yes, the supplier owns the inventory and we try to shape the supplier behavior to where it's beneficial for both the supplier and ourselves. Really, really nice. interesting. Yeah, thank you so much. Paulo, do you, do you wanna take one super quick last question or do you think we, we wrap up? Yeah, I think we can take one more. So let okay. me take the last one because I think sure. it's connected to the topic we are discussing right now. So um, the next question here is, what are the key factors to consider when selecting suppliers for a global supply chain network? How can advanced analytics <laughs> aid in the supplier selection process? So uh, that's so the the selection of suppliers uh, in that sense. It's more of a category management um, thing within Wayfair. So it 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 is more driven by what things we think the customers want to purchase in our website, and what things. Like for example, a German customer values more than a U.S. customer. The types of items that are in the two websites are different. So we're going to want to select suppliers for the two uh, regions that offer different portfolios that are in line with what uh, each customer expects. That's not something that my team specifically is working on, but. It's something that I know other teams at Wayfair, uh, specifically category management, uh, are working uh, on on selecting the suppliers that have the portfolio that we know the customers uh, are going to purchase in each specific market. All right. Well, thank you so much for all your answers, Rafael. We still have a lot of questions, but we, we don't have time to, to answer them all. But we really thank all of our learners uh, for the engagement, for sure. So again, thank you so much, everyone who decided to join us today. Uh, it's been a super insightful session. So thank you, Rafael, uh, once more. Uh, before we say goodbye, I just want to remind uh, everyone a couple things. First, um, as you guys know, this was the last live event of the Spring Series that Paolo and I have been co-hosting for the last three months uh, uh, between SE1X and SE3X. So it's been a real pleasure to share the experience with you guys. Um, second, um, you know, uh, some SEX courses are still open for enrollment. For those completing SE1X and SE3X, uh, it's important to uh, note that SE2X and SE4X are going to be opening really soon, uh, within one month. And so we encourage you to check them out on our website. Um, yeah, just uh, again, thank you, everyone. Paolo, Rafael, thank you so much. Um, if you want to share any final words with our uh, audience, the floor is yours, guys. Thank you so much, Rafael. Thank you so much, everyone. It was, it was a great session. And have a great day. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn or anything like that to ask questions, feel free to do that. Uh, happy to take questions offline as well. Thank you. All right.
Thank you, Thanks everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.